What's up, Jolyn? <laughs> yes, we are. <laughs> It took me out. It took me out. It took me out. All right. <laughs> Under the gun. I ain't even got no water. <laughs> that. See, God don't like ugly. <laughs> <laughs> Jolene, how are you doing today? Man, I'm really good. How are you doing? I'm fantastic. You know, I got a little bit of more, more <laughs> in my ears right now, but. Hi. Seriously, <laughs> don't do it. What could it possibly be? Like, why? Why did that happen? That's so confusing. Okay, let's just move on. <laughs> What's up, everybody? I am Mark Monroe, accompanied by my wonderful co-host, co-producer, co-creator, and all things galactic, and loving the fit today. Shout out to the wonderful. It's Jillian GC in the place to be on this fine Thursday. <laughs> And what's up, cousins? This is the Come Up series, but today we're doing a little bit something special today. Just, to, you know, a few tweaks here and there. But essentially, today is a School of Investing Day. And if you've ever seen a School of Investing Day, then you know what to be prepared for. But if you don't, then just know this. When it's a School of Investing Day, then that means that essentially grab your pen and paper if you don't already bring it. But essentially, we're going to definitely drop some notes and some education and some knowledge on you. Uh, our goal, uh, Jolyn, just as a heads up, is what is it to make sure that essentially that we can that we can close that wealth gap journey uh, within a decade or within a generation. So, if you're on this journey with us, Jumbo, thank you for joining us. Grab a seat. Make sure that you have all refreshments and everything else next to you. And of course, while you're doing that, make sure you hit that subscribe button. Because we would, tr we would truly just be appreciative. Look at that. I'm stumbling over my words. So you know that this is going to be a good episode. And on top of that, if you like what you see, as, especially if you like what you hear and what you learn, go ahead and hit that like button. And if you want to be in the know, just like who was first today, Jolyn? Who was it today? Keche. Hey. Shout outs to Keche for being the number one person, for having their notification right there on lock. We salute you and we appreciate you. And you hit that bell. So if you want to be, uh, if you, ugh, man, what is up with me today? If you want to have your name shouted out, then go ahead and have that bell selected. So that way you are notified at all times when new content comes out. All right. Whew. Now that we got past all of that, Jolyn, how do we do in today's markets? Can you take a sip of water for me since I'm the only one up in this piece with no refreshments? Hello. I cannot believe I left my water. My throat is already parched. All right, let's get into <laughs> let's get into what happened today in the market. Here we go. So the Dow was negative, <laughs> 526.47 points. Now we are currently occupying a level of 35,241.59 points. We have the S and P 500 negative 83.10 points, and now we're at a level of 4,504.08 points the nasdaq negative 304.73 points but we're still occupying this fourteen thousand dollar or a point level so we're at 14,185.64 the vix came up a little bit to 23.91 and the 10-year treasury note is living his best life <laughs> at over two percent it's at 2.035 percent so um, you know, you can see if you look at the the 10 year treasury note and see in general what um, well, you can look at XOK for tech in general and see if it's holding if it sinks, you know, it looks like it was pretty. <clears throat> so anyway, <laughs> that's a good thing, I guess. now heading over to sector performance, Mark, oh my gosh, did you know there are 11 sectors? Really? Yeah, we track the top three and the bottom three so we can see what that rotation is looking like. Rick, rick, rick. So we have materials, energy, and financials holding it down for the top three. And the bottom three um, would be utilities, uh, technology, and uh, real estate for our pick performance. If you want to know what all the picks are, you can head over to our Instagram page at that come up series. 
scroll through and find our last post regarding what these picks are, um, which are subject to change. We already told you when they're going to change. So if you don't know, then that means that you are behind in episodes. So catch up. So we got Datadog blowing it out the water with over 12.28% points to the upside. We have Disney um, after earnings up 3.35%. And obviously TBT is going to be up um, with 3.09% uh, for our bottom three. We have Adobe at negative 5.12%, AMD at negative 5.33%, and SE as in C limited negative 5.34%. So all the ones that were occupying the bottom rung of our pick list were all negative um, at least 5% or a little over 5% for all of them. So I don't know if that was some of your levels for some of those um, picks, but it's a little pullback for you there. <clears throat> so Mark, yes. you know, you already know yes. what month it is. Yes. You already know how we get down in a February. So shout out to the Come Up Series historian, Brian Clyette. He has okay, prepared. Cousin Finesse. <laughs> <laughs> the way he says finesse cracks me up, but okay, here we go. We have, we're going to be learning about Samori Torre. Um, he was born 1830 to 19. Hundreds. We have Warrior King, Empire Builder, and Hero of the Resistance against the French colonization of West Africa during the 19th century. Uh, Samari Torre was born around 1830 in the Milo River Valley in present-day Guinea. His father was a trader, leading Torre to follow his father's occupation early on. In the 1850s, he enrolled in the military forces at Medina, present-day Mali, to liberate his mother, who was a member of the Malinke ethnic group, captured during a raid. He subsequently acquired military skills during various campaigns he undertook for local chiefs before starting his own career. So Ture became a well-known leader, training and commanding a growing and disciplined army. He expanded his conquest, building a united empire called Mount Dinka. By 1874, he declared himself Fama, which means monarch, and established the capital of his kingdom at Bisen, ooh, can I read this? Bisendugu in present-day Gambia. In the 1800s, the empire expanded from Bamako, Mali in the north to the frontiers of British Sierra Leone in the Ivory Coast and Liberia in the east and the south. The Sudan was the eastward frontier. Torre's empire reached its apogee between 1883 and 1887, a period in which he took the title of al Mami, meaning the religious head of a Muslim empire. Um, there is more, but I'm gonna let you all uh, do your research on that because we have a lot to cover today um but it is always awesome during this time in the come up series history where we get to we go over black history from february 1st well whenever you know the first tuesday of the month is i should say all the way till juneteenth so you're getting history you're getting shade from mark you're getting uh you know juneteenth celebration vibes economics, market news, you're getting all this stuff during this jam-packed time. So, and then you get Mark over here with the bougie vibes. <laughs> you see how his, how his whole mood changes when he puts the shades on? Mark, what you feeling like? Tell him what you feeling like. You know, I'm, I'm, you know, I feel like it's a me season right now. So, you know. <laughs> okay. All right, all right. Uh, but no, shout out to the Shady Side Up for a wonderful, uh, you know, we, I don't know what the name, I don't know what the title is, so they haven't disclosed to me what the title of these, of these okay. uh, wonderful aviators are, but when they do let me know, I'll be sure to let y'all know, but I mean, yeah, thank you, y'all. It's very fitting. Shout out, Cameron Rome. We appreciate y'all. Yes. You know, it was funny, that story that you told me about when they heard about, like, uh, like somebody trading and how the language is just different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we out here. We out here. All right. 
So how should we get started? Because I know that we got questions. I know that we got like schools in session. So, you know, just let um, me know when it's time to ring the tardy bell. So that way, you know, class is in session. Well, let's get, let's, you know, be nice. Let's give people a chance to um, find, find a seat, you know, get out their materials. But let me see, we do have some questions. Um, now, we're going to see if these questions are not Google's Google. or not. <laughs> We're gonna see. I gave instructions to Google the question first and then get back to us. Okay. Um, but there was, oh, here's the question. What does well insulated mean in your portfolio? Well, oh man, so somebody was definitely paying attention to Twitter spaces today. Okay, so well insulated means that essentially that I can weather X amount of storms that may take that may transpire within the market without feeling nervous or anxious or anything like that. And on top of that, I'm very much so covered across the entire basis where I'm diversified within my portfolio. So that way, essentially, it's like if something were to happen, like AKA today, then maybe I may be trading, say, for example, volatility. So maybe UVXY um, or maybe even just the VIX. So that way on spikes up, then ultimately I can gain uh, I can gain some some pretty much some return there in the meantime that while say for example other positions may not be hitting as well i could also say for example be within the banks investment banks um because they may do better in say for example these high these high risk high volatility environments especially as it pertains to uh potential rate hikes on the horizon so those mm -hmm. are what i mean by having well insulation within my portfolio to weather any storms all right. Um, so speaking of weathering storms, um, a cousin, he or she um, has a contract. They have one contract and it's a okay. 2024 um, expiration. Dope. And so their question is, should they look to add puts on um, seasonally or because there's enough time, let it ride? I mean, you know, your position that you're holding until 2024, that's going to just continue to cook over a period of time. Um, if you'd like to, I mean, there's multiple, there's multiple combinations here in which that a person could literally attack that. So let's say if I want to hedge against my long-term position, I mean, the, t the two garbage quarters that normally take place throughout the year is the first quarter and the third quarter. So around the time that we receive Q4 earnings and also around the time that, you know, pretty much summer has, it's kind of like hit its peak and we're coming more so getting ready to go into the fall. Um, those are times in which that we typically see that the market is much more soft. So depending on what your portfolio is, because I don't know what position that you've taken, but you know, seasonality wise, you can do some research on when is it at the times in which that, that position is probably at its weakest and you could probably run a hedge against it. That's one strategy. The other strategy is you, you on weak times, you can add to that position. So that way you're not having to play puts against it, but essentially you're able to dollar cost average down into it as well as add to the position. That's a strategy. Um, another strategy in which that you can do is you can also start a whole new position in which that now you're not just locked into one contract, but essentially you have other positions in which that you can go for that may open up for you, especially within this market. That was just three examples, but you know, I probably have like maybe six, but that was a solid um okay another question is can the fed push us into a crash or recession if they are too aggressive with hate uh, yes with rate? yes and it was kind of interesting because i i talked about it on um spaces today as well and i said you know the fed has to be very very careful because if they come out too aggressive and essentially it can slow down the economy then essentially that leads us into a recession and that can also depress some markets um, if they say, for example, also don't do anything, then that can also cause the economy to also overheat, possibly. And with that being said, um, that could potentially create some issues as well. Um, let's see, you know, it's a delicate balance. And the thing is, a lot of folks are like, well, why isn't the Fed acted? Well, maybe the Fed is waiting on something. Maybe the Fed doesn't believe exactly what Wall Street is trying to force it to believe. Remember, Wall Street's focus is to make money and to return as much uh, as, to return as much uh, capital to its investors. Um, that's not the Fed's purpose. The Fed's purpose is a dual mandate, which is ultimately to look at employment as well as to look at 
say for example labor force participation as well as making sure that the economy and monetary policy is solid so with that being said if you go back and look at fed powell's you know tail of the tape look at what happened in 2018 he raised rates pretty aggressively he was pretty aggressive when it came to you know hey this is what we're going to do and we're going to go to two and a half another thing that what he did aggressively was when we came into the pandemic he went if you look back in march of 2020 you saw that essentially that there was a lot of activity that took place within that one month so the fed was you know cutting rates pretty quickly so if the fed really saw that there was like desperate need to act then they could literally just initiate and say you know what we're going to literally do rate hikes and we're going to start it now fed pal there's nobody that's stopping the 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 fed or the fomc from literally starting a rate hike environment like they could do it if they wanted to they could have done it at the last date uh i think back in january where where we were at the date where they could have said okay hey we're going to raise rates they did not they left them unchanged so with that being said it's like essentially they're following some type of blueprint and it's going to be very interesting to see exactly where wall street falls in line and what the fed does and ultimately, that's where we're at. So I think that he's skating a very fine line and understanding that there's certain parts of the economy that are doing very, very well that are roaring. But then there's other parts of the economy that are still very much so depressed. And a lot of the things that are happening within this inflationary environment have everything to do more so with the supply, with the supply side in which that the Fed doesn't really have that much power to really cause very much influence on that side at all. So again, you know, We'll see. So with the inflation rate, um, with the, what was the change? Over 7% um, from last year. Um, people are still out here purchasing. Do you think that that purchasing, despite the inflation uh, rates being um, higher than last year or from a year ago, I mean, um, do you think that has to do with being like frustrated with being, you know, like locked down, locked up, or what have you, um, in this type of environment. Can you say that again? Because you kind of went in and out on my side. So yeah, can you repeat that. So with, so we saw that inflation is much higher, yes. right? Um, and so the Fed is doing what they have to do um, within their toolbox um, to combat that. But from the consumer side. Um, Consumers are still spending, and I'm asking you, like, psychologically, do you think that that is because of um, being kind of like cooped up, locked down um, due to this uh, pandemic? I think it's that, but I think it's also in the sense that, you know, you know, we have to look at all the factors that play into inflation. You know, mm -hmm. people are starting to make more. When you think about like when more people within specific, when more people in a geographical area start mm -hmm. to make more money then essentially what's going to happen is it's going to also increase the cost of goods that are within that area like that's just going to happen um another thing that what we got to look at in the sense of you know the biggest question is you know i think we should look at like areas of like home defaults like home home loan defaults mm -hmm. you know that should be an area of you know, look towards the areas in which that you can see economically if there's real pain. You know, what does that look like? Look at cons look at consumer debt. Has that significantly increased to the point where people are borrowing to the hilt? We're not seeing those types of data points that are literally telling us that the economy is literally in that big of bad shape. Now, of course, on the borrowing or on the balance sheet side, yeah, forty trillion, you know, dollars. That's that's a lot of that's a lot of moolah. Um, but at the same token, it's like, you know, over a period of time, the Fed is going to do what they're going to do to pretty much ease the balance sheet. I think that ultimately what we could be seeing is the fact that in the midst of supply chain logistics issues, alongside with wage inflation, alongside with a pandemic, which also like at points in time, think about it, you saw ports closed or backed up. You saw ships out there at sea that literally couldn't, you know, literally bring in, uh, couldn't bring in goods or export goods you also see say for example blockages that are taking place in canada that are blocking you know things getting from canada to detroit um you see all the when those things start to happen it rises the costs um and businesses are making they're pushing that cost over to you know the consumer and the consumer so far has been able to pay it 
it's not until the part where we start to see that the slowdown in consumer spending, consumer debt starts to increase, um, where we start to see consumer sentiment or consumer confidence, home builder confidence, um, those arenas, tourism, all those things start to slow down. Those are the areas in which that it starts to bring you pause to say, okay, hey, wait a minute, something's not right here. Okay. That makes sense. Um, alrighty. Well, I think we've given everyone a chance, all the scholars, to um, take a seat, get cozy before we get to <laughs> Economics 201. Okay. Well, you ready, Jolyn? I'm ready. Let Got us, my note. Let us get started. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Come Up Series School of Investing. I am your professor, Mark Monroe. Uh, thank you for taking the time to sit down and, and, and receive knowledge in this course. We hope that you are well ready. Um, and today we talk about economics. This is 201. So if you missed 101 for the School of Investing, don't worry. There's a refresher course that's still within the archives that you can go back and check out. But let's go through today's Economics 201 of what are some of the things that we may have missed. So just as a slight brief refresher, what is economics? So, of course, economics is the study of people. I mean, in short, it's like a social science. It is a social science that a lot of folks look at. Um, but it seeks to explain what drives human behavior, the decisions and reactions when faced with difficulties or successes. Economics is one of the central disciplines underpinning the study of business and management and public policy. So a lot of the things in which that we do are very much so influenced by economics. A lot of the day-to-day -day actions that you take are very much so economical decisions. And don't worry, we'll get into that in a little bit. So let's discuss the impacts of economics. Well, economics affects our daily lives in both obvious and subtle ways. From an individual perspective, economic frames many choices we have to make about work, leisure, Jolyn, consumption, and how much to save. Our lives are also influenced by macroeconomic trends, such as inflation, interest rates, and economic growth facilitated change. So we talk about that, right? And it's like on a large and small scale. So what is the large side? The large side is the macro side, and the small side is the micro. So let's, let's quickly just do a quick breakdown, shall we? So large macroeconomics, which is concerned with how the overall economy works. Macroeconomics, which is concerned with how the overall economy works, it studies such things as employment, gross domestic product, which we'll get into, inflation, the stuff of news stories and government policy debates. Meanwhile, microeconomics is concerned with how supply and demand interact in individuals, individual markets uh, for goods and services. So AKA, think about it like this. If macroeconomics is the focus of things in which that we look at on the country side of things, so national, or say, for example, even global. Micro would be, say, for example, the businesses in between or the businesses within that ultimately have impact. And then we start to look at those things and say, OK, this is how it all starts to piece together from the micro pieces. They ultimately start to put together the larger picture, which leads us into this other thing. You all have heard about this thing called supply and demand, right? Well, did you know that it's actually a law? It's actually called the law of supply and demand. Now, I'm probably sure that everybody knows this, but let's just do a quick little refresher. So when we look at supply and demand, it, or the law of supply and demand, it is a theory that explains the interaction between the sellers of a resource and the buyers of that resource. And the theory defines the relationship between the price of a given good or a product and the willingness of people to either buy it or sell it. So again, it's like it's... You can have a product, you can have a service, but then at the end of the day, if nobody's willing to buy it, then essentially then that means that the demand is low. If, say for example, that you have a, you have a product on the flip side and everybody wants to buy it, then that means that essentially that the demand is high. And typically what we see is when demand is high, supply naturally runs low versus when when demand is low, supply tends to build up. And which we're kind of seeing in this current economy right now where well first things first let's just Sorry, like just, just let, let's just allow y'all to just like kind of like dissect that for a second because i just said a lot 
So let's just do a simple breakdown. So again, if we look at supply and demand, supply and demand have an important relationship because together they determine the price and quantities of most goods and services available in a given market. So let's say, for example, if I'm selling a pair of shoes at $100, but then everybody wants to come and buy these shoes and the, the, the line is around the corner. I can raise the price from $100 to $150 or $175. And ultimately, I know that essentially that I will probably have a dwindled down somewhat of folks that want to buy. But at the same token, I'm probably sure that based upon the data and by me doing simple tweaks of the numbers, I'll probably still have folks that will still want to buy the product because of its scarcity and the demand. So the law, the, the law of demand says that at higher prices, buyers will demand less of an economic good. The law of supply says that, a, that at higher prices, sellers will supply more of an economic good. These two laws interact to determine the actual market price and volume of goods that are traded on a market. So when you think about companies like Apple, or when you think about companies like Tesla, or when you think about companies like Nvidia and AMD, these are things that really reign true and supreme with each and every single one of these companies, hence the reason why they are very much so always watching supply chain and logistics, understanding exactly what the demand is, always looking at data, hence the reason why it created a market for, say for example, companies like Adobe, where they, well, Magento that Adobe later bought, where you can actually track the sales and track the demand and looking at Amazon and seeing exactly where those sales are coming from and who is willing to buy what. Several independent factors can affect the shape of a market supply and demand, influencing both the prices and quantities that we observe in these markets. So that's what we see as it pertains to the law of you know, supply and demand, which takes us into the next thing. GDP, also known as gross domestic product. Now, did you know that there's actually two other things that are actually within the same thing, but everybody always focuses towards GDP. There's uh, gross domestic, there's gross national product, and then there's also gross national income. So those are things also. So there's GDP, GNP, and GNI. But the thing that always gets the most shine is GDP. It is a measure used to evaluate the health of a country's economy. It is the total value of the goods and services produced in a country during a specific period of time, usually one year. So like, for example, when we look at annual GDP, now, of course, we get GDP numbers on a, on a sometimes monthly basis or on a quarterly basis, depending on the country. But overall, they're always comparing year over year. So let's look at it, right? Because when we think about GDP, so if you look at, like, for example, the countries, like, look at China's GDP for its population, you know, China represents 16.86 trillion in GDP versus the United States represents 22.94 trillion. And then, you know, the very next, that's the, that's the next biggest would probably be Japan at 5.1 and then of course so on and so on and so on now the thing is is like you know not all things are always created say for example equal because of course gdp looks at a few things it looks at exports imports and cost those all those things come together and put it in so for example if you really think about it which of these countries probably produces the most when it comes to exports and then which of these countries actually imports the most? So when we think about GDP, think about it like this. The monetary value of all finished goods and services made within a specific period, a.k.a. like a year, GDP provides an economic snapshot of a country used to estimate the size of an economy and growth rate. So growth rates really matter because when you start, like notice this, when you start to see that GDP is starting to slow down, GDP is always looked at as a, as a key indicator of what we could be seeing as a precursor for a, a potential country or say, for example, even on a global scale of a global recession. So GDP can be calculated in three ways using expenditures, production or incomes. It can be adjusted for inflation. 
and population to provide deeper insights. Because if you look at these charts, if you, or if you look at this chart right now, it literally says just one thing. It literally just shows you the numbers. But then you have to put it into perspective because China has way more of a population than the United States, and so too does India. So mm -hmm. just something to, t to take into consideration that not everything is created equal. Now, remember, we talked about, say, for example, a few things that we we're going to mention, which is like scarcity and opportunity cost. So opportunity cost is quite simple, like for, for most folks, but pretty much it's just a simple concept that quantifies the impact of selecting one option instead of another, the next best alternative, right? So for example, if we just keep it simple, you know, opportunity costs, working to earn some money or going to a university to get a degree. Choice one versus choice two. And if we also go further, it's the thing that is like opportunity cost is the thing that is given up when given a choice. So you're gonna choose one over the other and ultimately it's going to have some type of benefit. So when we look at opportunity cost for everybody at home, here I'm gonna give you two different formulas to put together for opportunity cost. So I want you to write this down. Opportunity cost equals total revenue minus economic profit. That's the first part. And the other side of it is opportunity equals what one sacrifice over what one gains. So I'll run it back for the replay just in case if somebody kind of like, you know, like missed it. So the first part of this equation is opportunity cost equals total revenue minus economic profit. And then the other one is opportunity costs equals what one sacrifices over what one gains. Okay, so then we get into this other thing where it goes hand in hand with opportunity costs. So when we think about it is, it's called scarcity. So a lot of times what we think, what we think about in scarcity, scarcity is widely used to essentially like really dictate a lot of the things in which that we see, especially in 2021 and 2022. For example, when we look at scarcity, here's a definition for y'all. Scarcity is a situation that results from the fact that we don't have the ability to satisfy all of our wants. So what I want you to do for all of you that will have homework tonight, I want you to literally put a draw a line down your paper we're going to do some YouTube magic here. I want you to put a line down the, down the center of your paper or on your tablet, whatever it is. And so there's another definition when we come to the economic standpoint. When we say scarcity is when supply of a resource cannot meet demand. And that's what you're seeing right now within, say, for example, multiple different sectors. So that's that other part. I'll read, I'll read it back to you all again. Scarcity is when supply of a resource cannot meet demand. All right, so here, here we go. We're getting ready to, um, we're getting ready to do some, some magic here. You ready, Jolyn? I'm ready. I wrote my line down my tablet. Okay. Now, if you, if, if, if drawing a line down the, down the middle of the tablet doesn't work, or down the middle of your sheet doesn't work, you can also write a scale. It's like a balancing scale. So, because that's ultimately how we see scarcity. So when we think about it, scarcity means the limits. Uh, of the limited the limitless human wants so the things that all of us as people what are the things that we constantly want like for example you know it, it kind of represents infinity right like the wants are always going to be infin infinite so for example what are some of the things that i want you to write down on your sheet of paper what are some of the things that you want like just like anything possible, like just write it down on that side of the sheet, all the things in which that you want. Okay. I want it and I want all. Oh Lord, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> and then on the other side of the sheet, I want, so that way everybody can understand scarcity. Mm -hmm. I want you to understand that scarcity on the right side would represent, say for example, limited resources and time. So like the average person wants food, fun, travel, homes, cars, jewelry, etc. right? You know, the money, car, jewels and all that all those things.
but then the things that are limited in resources and time are land, labor, capital, enterprise. Labor, what's that? <laughs> Here you go. So let's let's think about it, right? Limited resources and unlimited wants. And in between is scarcity of goods and services. So now we must we find ourselves where we must make a choice. So let's say society has three options for dealing with scarcity. Either one, it's going to be economic growth. Two, it's going to be improve the use of available resources. Or three, <laughs> which is sometimes a lot of parents, if you're a parent out there or, you know, I've, I kind of felt it from my grandfather. Shout out to Louis St. Cyr. Reduce expectations. <laughs> <laughs> so let's do it again. On one side, you have at the top, you have limited resources. And then you have on the other side, in the far right side, you have unlimited wants. And then the middle of that, you have scarcity of goods and services. Draw an arrow down and say, okay, hey, must make a choice, a.k.a. we're, we're economizing the problem. So then we find ourselves making, we have undesirable alternatives, a.k.a. sometimes a prisoner's dilemma. Society's three options for dealing with scarcity. And this will always happen. Either we're going to do something that's going to create some type of economic growth. So essentially we find a way to either, you know, use a different resource or we, you know, we find something economically which allows us to use less resources or say, for example, we just improve the, through human ingenuity what available resources currently exist. No, the slides are not supposed to be changing because apparently, you know, we ran out of time to literally put it together. Like I tell you guys, honestly, when I do these presentations, they're right off the top of the dome. So every presentation that you all see is literally prepared. What is it, Jolyn? 30 minutes before the show? Depending. Correct. But honestly, it's on brand because we're talking about scarcity and we have a scarcity of time. We have so. a scarcity of time. So as you can see, which ties it all in together, literally when we find ourselves in that situation, you know, think about exactly how ultimately the world operates, where it's like we're constantly on this, we're constantly on this journey of scarcity. Now, of course, there's other things like demand curves and supply curves and all this other stuff which you can go into, you can go down a rabbit hole. But really, here are some of the topics that we just talked about just to refresh you. We talked about scarcity. We talked about opportunity costs. We talked mm -hmm. about GDP. We talked about macro and microeconomics. And I think that kind of like topped it off, didn't it? Like, oh, of course, the law of supply and demand. With all mm -hmm. those things, each one of those, here's your homework. Find out exactly how these things impact your daily life, whether it's through the markets, of course, which we always hear about, or say, for example, just in your personal everyday life. So, for example, you know, the resources, you know, think about teachers and how is it that they find themselves in huge scarcity situations where they're having to essentially help students literally you know be the best of students and the most educated students within their classes but while working on limited resources you see mm -hmm. how that works like the thing mm -hmm. is is like the things that we that we think about just like math economics surrounds us in everyday life from every decision that you make from say for example when you wake up in the morning and you choose to say for example when you look to make a purchase or when you look to go to the gas station, we've all been in those situations before where it's like your funds may be a little bit limited. And at the same token, based upon the limited of your funds, that may dictate exactly how much gas that you can actually put in your car or yeah. say, for example, how much you can go shop for or say, for example, it impacts your groceries. And also, for example, how many of you have ever seen a utility bill that was ridiculously sky high? And then ultimately you look at your accounts and say, well, I could pay for it, but do I really want to have to do it? See, again, it's wants, the, the limitless wants that we have versus, say, for example, <laughs> the available resources that are actually at our disposal. 
Mm. Okay. All right. So you see what we did there. All right. So <laughs> with the homework, yep. you said we were supposed to look and see how the topics we covered today impact our daily lives. Correct. Okay. Make sure I got that written down here. All right. So when we're, let me see, how do we take this a step further? Okay. So if we're talking about re limited resources, scarcity, all that, mm -hmm. and our um, limitless wants, yep. um, how, how do we hold that in context for when we are dreaming and thinking bigger? Can we what? just put a pause on scarcity and just get wild with it? Of you know, course. And of course. Bring it back? Because here's the thing, even the dreams in which that we have are limited. Mm -hmm. Say more. Let me run that back for you. <laughs> the dreams that many of you have are nine times out of 10 going to be limited. And here's the reason why. Nine times out of 10, when you have a dream to do something and then you start on that dream, you start to see exactly how closer that you really are to the finish line of that dream. Now, of course, it's going to take time, which ultimately time is limited. But yet at the same token, it's like when you start putting the necessary work in, you start realizing exactly how much steam and how fast you're starting to pick up towards that want to accomplish or to reach that dream. And therein, that's the focus of dreaming bigger because of the fact that even then, even in our in our human capacity, you mm -hmm. know, it's impossible for us to like literally think like on the lines of the cosmos. Like where it's like the the, you know, pretty much the solar system. You know, is mm -hmm. it's not the sky itself that is your limit, but it's the galaxy or say, for example, you know, world Earth two or Earth three, which could be, say, for example, your limit in which that you reach. And again, it always starts. When you, huh? What if you're galactic? If you're galactic, then, you know, hey, you know, <laughs> maybe the heavens, are your, know. maybe the Just heavens are your. Just some water for me. <laughs> maybe that maybe the heavens are your are your limit. <laughs> hmm. Okay, so then that brings us to another excellent point as we are in year two yes. of economics. I mean, not to bring, you know, Kwanzaa early, but I mean, <laughs> with cooperative economics, yes. we got to get that down pat we do. as well. We do. I mean, you know, in order to do things in life, you know, it's like nobody ever makes it there successfully by themselves. Like in mm -hmm. the history of all success stories, nobody's ever made it successful by themselves. And if they did, then it's like, you know, shout outs to you, kudos, you're an alien that's walking amongst humankind, you know, but for the most part, you know, there's always going to be people in whom which that are going to be around you that played a part. Maybe in your, in your mind, you may see that as not as significant, but economically, just think about it like this and how it journeys back. Like think about how economics, like, you know, have had such an influence on so many different things. Like, take roads, for example. Like, one of the biggest controversies is roads. Now, okay. a lot of folks don't realize that when a lot of the highways that were designed ultimately ran exactly through, you know, the communities of color, AKA the black communities, which ultimately decimated them. And then when you, when you think about that, Think about the economic impact that it had when you had businesses that were booming, that were ultimately thriving, that looked like each and every single one of us, but had mm -hmm. highways that ran directly through them to literally separate one, one, say, for example, people of color from another set of people of color. Mm, prime example is the um, light rail in Seattle going through MLK. Correct. Mm. When we think about that, when we think about all economic decisions, Mm -hmm. When we think about all things that are economic, it goes beyond, say, for example, what we typically see that, you know, ab above an unemployment, you know, rate or above an inflation rate. You know, many times inflation starts right there from your own home or right there from your pocketbooks, right there from even the education in which that your children will probably experience. It's like to think that essentially that it's limited to just say, for example, just goods or products. You know, that's only a part of the equation. Services also. You know, one of the interesting things is that when we look at, like, in many cases, you know, 
I, I will, I, you know, maybe the cousins should should think about doing this as a project, you know, and it, maybe it's a collective project because people are from are from different areas. Think about, say, for example, the cost to buy something that, say, for example, maybe it's chicken or say, for example, it's a glass or, or a gallon of milk. Like, for example, in Hawaii, why is a gallon of, of milk in Hawaii pretty much almost ten dollars or if not ten dollars but here in washington state the value of a gallon of milk is probably at five bucks yeah i think lily just entered the chat <laughs> so yeah uh, the highs are high in uh hawaii correct but like, think about it like this what's the number one what's the what's the number one thing that essentially when we look at hawaii what's the number one revenue driver for hawaii tourism okay well what's the number one revenue driver that we would say for washington state i don't know apples <laughs> <laughs> well it's a it's a combination of things but mm -hmm. yet at the same token what dictates the fact that essentially outside of the fact that a lot of things are imported what else should be dictating the reason why that the prices are so high another because thing that you can look at is people make look at the cost of electricity around the united states Look at Where the does cost. it cost the most? California? The world may never know. That's the that's the thing for the cousins. Come together with a project and literally say, let's let's just keep it simple. I want everybody to look up exactly in your home city or your home state and literally find out exactly what the cost is per kilowatt hour in your state. And let's find out where is the cheapest kilowatt hour and where is the most expensive kilowatt hour in the United States amongst the cousins. And, and then let me see know. exactly mm -hmm. like, okay, hey, well, what does that look like economically? What separates, you know, the cost of ours versus theirs? What's happening? Mm -hmm. But in, in, in conclusion, it always comes back to, it always comes back to economics. You know, if you really look at the market, right? The market is, the market is dictated by economics. The bond market reflects that. Think about mm -hmm. it. Like if the bond market didn't reflect that, which is a precursor to a lot of the economic data or say, for example, in some cases, a lagging factor to the economic data, then if mm -hmm. that's the case, when we saw the 10 year treasury jump, then why is it that essentially that we saw that stocks sold at wire equities down? Because now it's cheaper. Oh, you mean you would make more money. Well, in theory, with um, the bonds. So people take their money out but, of... Huh? Is that true? Because let's look at it. If we look at the Fed funds rate, right? I'm talking about psychology, though. Oh, That's well, what yeah, people yeah. think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. because if, if we look at it in reality, the Fed funds rate is still at 0.25. So if you're buying, like, say, for example, this bond, the return that you're getting on this bond is probably not the same when we think about it as it pertains to real rates. Like, another thing is, like, when we see that more, when mortgage rates climb up, home values start to drop, mm -hmm. you know, but at the same token, how will that look in this environment, given in the sense that we're still dealing with a significant supply issue of say, for example, the available amount of homes in the United States. Right. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Cause <laughs> I feel like the, the, the amount of people experiencing homelessness, just continues to skyrocket and we're not really doing much about it yeah it was funny because i was chatting with somebody uh the other day and you know to buy some food to buy like let's take a simple place like chick-fil-a to buy food from chick-fil-a for them it mm -hmm. would cost like say for example sixty dollars but then mm -hmm. say for example if i bought that same order here in washington state i'm paying close to a hundred dollars it's because of well, we also have to consider our tax rate. Okay. <laughs> well, okay, well, why is the cost more? Think about the cost of living. Think about the economics well, behind it. They're basically like, y'all got it. Yeah. I don't charge. I mean, think about it. Like, it, like, why do you think that real estate is so expensive in California, New York, Washington State, and a few others versus real estate once upon a time not being as expensive in places like Texas, Florida, Georgia. It's the educated workforce. They are getting paid more in their jobs. And so they, the theory is like, y'all got it. You can afford this. We're raising the prices. 
And then people from places like California, if they're getting priced out, then they're going to overtake Texas. They're going to overtake Washington. And then that drives the price up even more. And then they're going to move to the next metropolis. And then they're going to raise the price of that spot. And the next thing you know, it's just going to be expensive all across the board. And if people aren't working or if they are working but now you don't even have to come to the office now like being in the office is not even a factor you can work remotely who knows where people are going to work next it's funny because it's like when you start looking at those types of factors and looking at the cost mm -hmm. of living then it kind of makes sense and where you could kind of start seeing exactly where people would ultimately jump to as the next frontier states or places to live based upon mm -hmm. the fact of cost of living here versus cost of living here and companies are starting like if you think about it just follow the companies like think about it why would intel invest 20 billion dollars in, in ohio to build factories there they're looking it's for the cheapest places as it pertains to where they can find labor versus essentially you know, having to deal with, like, a lot of companies are looking to do that. They're going to places where the labor is ultimately cheap right now versus mm -hmm. essentially trying to compete against places like China. Now, once upon a time, China was very, very cheap, but now the cost in China has also started to increase as their economy started to improve. Thus, a lot of people started moving from China and thus moving into places like Vietnam and many other places and India and then think about like the software engineer boom that we saw within India. Like yes. to pay software engineers in India is cheaper once upon a time. But now those costs are starting to rise because of the fact that the talent itself has also shown and shown itself approved and the, it raises the cost of living. Mm. So, you know, mm. it's, it's those types of things in which that when we look at it, you know, it really like you start to look at it from the businesses are just a small part of this entire thing. They're trying mm -hmm. to navigate with the limited resources versus essentially their wants too. They're also in a scarcity environment. Then when they come down to choices, now it comes to an opportunity cost decision. And then when we think about it from a GDP standpoint, and that's the thing that I want each and every single one of you to pay attention to, because you know, as we move forward, does GDP slow down or is GDP picking up? You know, what does that look like? If it starts slowing down, we're going to have a problem. That is a fact. <laughs> <laughs> that is a fact. But from what I hear, there are places where we're starting to see that inflation are starting to come down. And if they're coming down in specific areas, then, you know, inflation a lot of folks like to believe that it's very much so, uh, what's the word? You know, it's, it's very specific to a specific location. That's not true. Think about it mm. like this. Inflation, amongst many other things within the economic landscape, are very much so systemic. So if it's happening here, you're asking, you're asking like, for example, if you're asking, hey, Mark, are we getting ready to go into recession? You're asking the wrong question. You need to be asking yourself, who is it? Mm. I wish we had some dramatic dun dun dun, 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 dun. dun. <laughs> <laughs> So who isn't experiencing inflation? Let me write that down. Or who isn't experiencing it as much? You know, when we think about like, you know, Federal Reserve, you know, do they kind of like run in tandem with other central banks? Are those mm -hmm. things systemic? You know, UK has now gotten itself up to, say, for example, 0.5 in their in their funds rate. Well, the United States is sitting at 0.25. I would say look at the inflation rates across the globe. And if you think about it, just go to the G20. Just go okay. through the G20 of, you know, and look at what their inflation rates currently are. It'll be very, very interesting to show you, like, you know, who has the high inflation and who does not. And what are they doing or what is it that they've done to kind of tame down inflation? What does their economy look like? It'll, it'll show you some things. Okay. Well, Mark, Economics 201 was a very informative. We have 
I feel like you gave 80 jillion homework assignments. <laughs> well, I mean, that's second year. I mean, in first year, it's like, okay, guys, here's one little assignment for you. But in second year, no, nah, y'all been around the block before. So ultimately, y'all got to get it in gear. And so ultimately, I think that this is dope because some of this homework can float over into Supplemental Sundays. You know, that ultimately gives you guys some further material there. You know, ask yourselves this. Like, are we going into a recession? The cousins should come together and you guys could be some of the biggest data analysts, the biggest data analyst research community that there is. You know, I'll leave you with this. A lot of folks think that Wall Street is made up of tons of traders and folks in whom wish that are sitting there clicking buttons. You're wrong. 80% mm -hmm. of Wall Street is made up of researchers and folks in whom wish that literally just take the time to just study supply chains. They study economics. They study, say, for example, companies. And on top of that, they put it all together. And then it's like, all right, well, hey, for the folks that actually have trading desks, they send the data over to the trading desk and to the, to the quant team for them to try to strategize, hey, what's our move? But most of it is done in the lab. 80% of Wall Street is done in the lab. 90, uh, majority of the folks that work on Wall Street are researchers. They're researchers and analysts. They spend most of their time researching and analyzing, you know, the world. Hmm. Imagine if all the cousins, you know, got on that collaborative tip and just started, you know, researching, fellowshipping, you know, all that. Mm -hmm. hmm. Well, um, I feel like we have reached our uh, our our hour of, of power. Yeah. So hopefully y'all have learned so much in today's episode. And for some of you, you're going to be like, Mark, wait a minute, but that's okay. Pawn the replay and it's okay to Google alongside, say, for example, the episode as well. So, you know, take your time. It's not going to just all come to you all at once, but essentially just take it in bits and pieces. And over periods of time, you'll start to see that, okay, you're learning. You're growing just like you did in year one. And for those in whom wish that this is your year one, honestly, don't be discouraged. You know, a lot of it seems like it's very high level. It's not. You can do this. You know, mm -hmm. another thing to do is start testing yourself. Start testing your knowledge. Start explaining what you're learning to other people. The more that you start explaining, the more that the words and the knowledge starts to feel more like second nature and now becomes wisdom. And that's ultimately the goal. Until next time, y'all. I'm Mark Monroe. And I'm Jalen GC, looking at this economy. No, I'm just kidding. Jalen GC in the place to be. <laughs> and this was your come up, AKA through the School of Investing. We hope you enjoy. Continue to keep learning because the more you learn, the more you earn. We'll see y'all next week. Peace.